Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, and I'm talking to Mark Priestley, a research fellow at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Mark and I recently uh, discussed the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe, VE Day, the date when the uh, German military officially surrendered in, in, in Europe. And we discussed the part played by the codebreakers at Bletchley Park that led up to the German surrender in Europe. That video is, of course, available on the TNMOC YouTube channel. Uh, and we had a question following up from that via Twitter, uh, which I thought uh, would be great for, uh, for Mark and I to come back on. That's what we're all about here. We're, we're talking to people over uh, via social media all the time. So it's a really good, good to pick this kind of stuff up. Uh, the question came from David Doe. Um, what do we think about the impact of Churchill's GCHQ post-war strategy with Colossus? Denial, secrecy, and Cold War intel a worthwhile trade for hobbling a world leading in computing? Serious question. Well, Mark, what do we think about the impact of Churchill's GCHQ post-war strategy in Colossus? I mean, what actually happened to Colossus uh, at the end of the war? And Colossus obviously being this uh, amazing machine that was built to break the Lorenz encryptions, which were incredibly difficult for the human code breakers to, to crack. Well, Gavin, um, I've heard the story about Churchill's decision to scrap all the Colossi at the end of the war, but never seen any actual hard evidence um, to support that story. What we do know is that actually after V-Day, they carried on um, using all the Colossi and the Robinsons to break the fish all the people who are still at Bletchley Park. Uh, you can stop um, decoding messages now. And at that point, the 9th of July, um, they started making plans for um, which machines they were going to keep, which machines they were going to scrap. And the plans had actually been made by Max Newman a month before in June. Uh, Max Newman was the man who was in charge of the kind of Colossus department, the Colossus, Colossus section of Bletchley Park. And he was of the opinion that um, after the war, uh, the Colossus wouldn't actually be ready for any practical work. Um, the, Colossi were, the Colossus machines were like a thoroughbred. They were, they, were, they were kind of designed to do one particular task very well and very quickly, but they were very, very specialized. So when the Germans stopped using the Lorentz machine, um, there wasn't actually much purpose in keeping the Colossus machines. So what Newman recommended was that two be kept for research purposes and the rest were broken down. Um, they had a lot of parts which were very, you know, still valuable in the post-war world for the GPO to reuse. Mm. Um, and as far as we know, that's what happened in, in, in July. Um, GCHQ kept two of the Colossuses. Uh, and as far as we know, they were, they were kept. And they were only kind of taken down in 1960. Mm. Um, the remainder were gradually broken down um, and some of the parts were sent back to the GPO. Max Newman himself took a lorry load of parts up to Manchester where he was starting a project after the war to build a, an electronic computer. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what happened to those parts. But um, mm. so, so the story, the, the Churchill story is, I think, a little bit of a myth, actually. Okay. So uh, what then happened to Britain's computing in, in industry after the war? Obviously, it's a large subject. So... Uh, it's 1950. Where are we? Well, in, in a nutshell, uh, after the war, um, three or four um, computer projects started in the UK, three projects to build electronic, general purpose electronic computers. By 1950, two of those uh, projects had developed in working computers, one at Manchester and one at Cambridge. And the third one at the National Physical Laboratory was, you know, it, it, would, be, it would be working up, up within the year. So by the beginning of the 50s, um, the UK had three working electronic computers. So it really was a world leader at that point. The Americans obviously had a lot of projects going on at the same time, which were in some ways more ambitious and better funded. But um, the Brits did manage to sort of put them to the post in actually getting machines up and running in those, in those pre-war, post-war years. Mm. And uh, was there any connection between Bletchley Park and, and post-war computing at all? Uh, well, there were many. Um, I think uh, Max Newman is one obvious connection. He was he'd been in charge of the machine the machine section uh, in the fish effort during the war. After the war, he went to Manchester University, uh, where he was particularly interested to start a project to build an electronic computer. So that expertise and knowledge that he had about electronic computing, he took that directly with him from Bletchley Park to. Um, to Manchester. An even more direct um, link perhaps is with the project uh, for the National Physical Laboratory, um, which from I think the middle of 1945 onwards, the director of the mathematics division there, John Womersley, had a plan to build a user. He'd been to America and seen the American ENIAC and EDVAC projects, which were the kind of cutting edge of, mm. they were the projects where the, 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 the design of the modern computer, the actual physical design of the modern computer really got nailed down. Yeah. So he came back full of enthusiasm. He tried to recruit, he recruited Alan Turing to work at the National Physical Laboratory to design um, their machine. Uh, but interestingly, at that stage, they also wanted the um, GPO engineers 
from Dollis Hill, who had built Colossus. They were hoping they could use that same, those links with the GPO to build the new machine at the National Physical Laboratory. And this was, a, this was a really concrete proposal. So in September 1945, Tommy Flowers, the designer of Colossus, and Will Chandler, one of his colleagues, they went to America and spent some weeks visiting the ENIAC and EDVAC projects in America, uh, and then came back with the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of technology transfer in both directions. I mean, the Americans mm -hmm. after the war were trying to get hold of a, a Colossus, <laughs> unfortunately, mm -hmm. after they'd been taken down. So I don't think they ever actually got one. Uh, but the Brits were also taking a lot of information about the American projects. Um, uh, back into these post-war computing building projects. Mm. Unfortunately, the collaboration between the National Physical Laboratory and the GPO didn't really happen. Uh, the GPO had lots of other um, pressing business after the war, like rebuilding Britain's telephone network. Yeah. And Tommy Flowers himself uh, made the decision to stay with the GPO rather than move into the computer industry. Yeah. And so the, the National Physical Laboratory ended up having to, um, you know, build their computer in-house rather than having the Bletchley Park experts build it, which mm. probably explains part why that one took longer to to build than the Cambridge and Manchester machines. Yeah. But there were certainly, I, mean, I don't see any evidence that, you know, all the expertise that there was building electronic machines at Bletchley Park. I think people did try and make them, you know, they did make as much use of it as possible after the war. Mm. So, I mean, are you saying that uh, post-war computers in the UK kind of derive from the work at Bletchley Park? Um, not entirely, because obviously there's, there's a lot more, I mean, the Colossus wasn't really a general purpose computer. Um, and the, the kind of means when, when after the war, when were, people were trying to build general purpose computers, this was a different sort of machine. They wanted machines which had, had a large general purpose memory, so they could store numbers mm. and do calculations essentially. And they wanted machines which could um, be instruct, have a program, be, have a series of instructions that they embed one after the other. So after after the war, the plan was to build these general purpose mathematical machines. Colossus was a very special purpose machine, and in particular, it didn't have a large, it didn't have very much memory. It didn't it didn't need it for the jobs it was doing in the war, mm -hmm. and it didn't follow a program of instructions. So there was a lot more um, knowledge and technology that needed to go into these uh, computer projects than could specifically have been got from Bletchley Park. Right. Yeah. Uh, in particular, yeah. Sorry, come. Yeah. I was going to say so, and, and then of course there was a lot of work going on with people like Morris Wilkes and, and Freddie Williams, I believe, wasn't there? Yeah, I was going to say so. In particular, I mean, the, the one the one thing that was really problematic building these new computers after the war, both in Britain and America, was building a large memory mm. that, that would store the data for um, the the, uh, the calculations needed, and the technologies that they uh, were experimenting with at that time both really came from radar so there was a thing called a, a mercury delay line which was basically a big tube of mercury through which pulses passed uh, was one possible storage mechanism and, there were, and also used um, cathode ray tubes of various as storage devices and both of these technologies came from radar um, so uh, so Maurice Wilkes for example who you mentioned who was led the Cambridge project to build a computer had a radar background as did Freddie Williams, the, the man who did a lot of the actual engineering of the Manchester machine. Uh, Newman was like the brains behind it, but he wasn't the person who actually built the machine. Right. Okay. So, so the, this post-war thing, it was a coming together of, of, you know, a lot of the design that the Americans had come up with, technological expertise from a range of wartime technologies, not just not just from Bletchley Park, but the, right. the Bletchley Park, you know, insofar as it could, the Bletchley Park expertise certainly played its part in, in yeah. those developments. So, if you had to kind of sum up uh, the the original question, how how would you kind of that's a, that's a lot. How would you kind of sum things up for us? Do you think? If I'm going to sum it up very quickly, I think I'd say that the secrecy around Colossus and the code breaking activities at Bletchley Park um, at the end of the war didn't prevent that the the knowledge and experience that had been built up at Bletchley Park being applied to the the post war um, computer building activities in the UK. Uh, and I said by 1950, the UK was a world leader. Um, it went a bit differently after that, but I don't think you can blame that on, on the secrecy around the, the GCHQ. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think that really captures things very, uh, really nicely. And hopefully that gives uh, David and everyone else something to kind of really kind of think on. And obviously, don't forget, everybody, please send us more of your questions. Hashtag AskTNMOC. Get them over to us via Twitter. Thank you very much.